Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter and today I'm here again with Dr. David Buss to continue our conversation about his book When Men Behave Badly, The Hidden Roots of Sexual Deception, Harassment and Assault. You will find the link to the first part in the description box of this interview. David, uh, Dr. Buss, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's a uh, delighted to talk to you again, Ricardo. Okay, so uh, let me first ask you, uh, so I've already had some anthropologists on the show with whom I talked about this, but uh, since we're talking about sexual conflict here, do you think that knowing perhaps what is uh, the preferred mating system in humans, if it's monogamy, polygamy, what form of polygamy, polyandry, polygyny, do you think that that's important for us to understand where sexual conflict comes from and perhaps the different forms it takes? Yeah, um, I, I guess I think that um, that classification system, and admittedly I haven't thought about that deeply, but I think that classification system has um, caused more confusion uh, than clarification. So. Um, so for so so I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that. So you take polygamous cultures, cultures that are legally polygamous. Well, within those cultures, a lot of people mate monogamously. Small number of men mate poly, poly, polygynously, one man, multiple women. Um, and so uh, and so characterizing the culture as polygynous or polygamous doesn't really clarify. Or, or, or in many Western cultures, we are presumptively monogamous, but of course people have affairs, they have serial wives, serial marriages, serial long-term mating relationships. And so characterizing it as monogamous doesn't really clarify anything either. So what I think does clarify it, and the way that I look at it, of course I would think that the way that I look at it is the clarifying way of looking at it, uh, is that we have a, this menu of mating strategies, and it includes long-term mating, short-term mating, infidelity mating, serial mating, uh, polygynous mating, uh, when men are in a position to do so, so either by due to their status or their or their resources, uh, or even in presumptively monogamous cultures, you get serial mating or mating with infidelity, which it is in essence polygynous mating. And so I think the formal classification uh, of those things, trying to characterize an entire culture with those labels just doesn't really capture the underlying menu of mating strategies and underlying sexual psychology that humans have. Right. And since you studied jealousy, do you think that that tells us anything about perhaps uh, the mating preferences of people in terms of, for example, uh, would jealousy only make sense in an evolutionary context where humans were mostly monogamous or not? Well, um, yeah, no, no, not necessarily, no, not at all. Uh, I mean, they're quite, go to the Tiwi, the Tiwi tribe of uh, Northern Australia, they're, they're polygynous, uh, you know, the high status men have multiple wives, but but boy, when they uh, when the, when there's an interloper who has sex with one of their wives, it's it gets deadly, you know, uh, or can get deadly. And so um, and so, it, yeah, it's uh, so I mean, from an evolutionary perspective, the way that I think about sexual jealousy is it's an emotion that emerges primarily in long term mating relationships. And those could be monogamous or polygynous. So if you have three wives, you still don't want other men to have sex with one of your wives. It's not like, oh, well, I have three, please, other males that have, you know, I'm not jealous at all. Uh, so so I, I think that it's, an, it's a universal emotion. Uh, the anthropologist Margaret Mead tried to claim uh, that there were cultures where there was no jealousy, you know, like in the Samoan Islands. And, of course, subsequent anthropologists discovered, and even in her own books on the Samoan Islands, she describes many episodes of jealousy, including homicide due to sexual jealousy. So, uh, so I think it's a universal human emotion. 
that emerges primarily in long-term mating contexts, much less so in short-term mating. Right. And why do people have affairs? I mean, in the case of men, I guess it's perhaps uh, easier is not the best word here, but let's go with it easier to understand in the sense that the optimal uh, reproductive strategy for men would be to impregnate as many women as possible. Uh, but, uh, yeah, and uh, but in terms of women, I mean, why do they have affairs? Yeah, this is a great question, and it's a, been a relatively neglected topic. So, um, uh, the the this is an area where I uh, differ or depart from most other evolutionary psychologists on the issue, and have changed my mind on on the what motivates women to have affairs. So. The traditional explanation, or the, the historically the most um, ancient explanation, uh, scientific explanation in evolutionary psychology, is what's called the dual mating strategy hypothesis. So where where women uh, uh, can get resources from one guy, but good genes from another guy. And in a game theoretic sense, in principle, the hypothesis is perfectly reasonable. Um, you know, that is, if a woman could do it, she would choose the man with the highest quality genes, genes for good health, for example, or sexy son genes, um, and also get the resources from, you know, uh, other guys. And we know that the high status uh, men sometimes are reluctant to devote all their resources to, to one woman. So, uh, so in principle, it's a viable hypothesis. Uh, but I started to question it, I don't know, maybe... 10, 10 years ago or so. Initially, I thought, well, this is a great explanation. And initially, there was empirical evidence that seemed to support it. And the primary empirical evidence was that um, that, uh, that that women experience mate preference shifts at ovulation to prefer more masculine and more symmetrical men. Um, and masculinity and symmetry were regarded uh, as markers of genetic quality. Uh, and, and the hypotheses behind those were also perfectly reasonable. Uh, that is, you know, the hypothesis with uh, masculinity was that testosterone, uh, that the masculine features are a product of testosterone production in the body during development. Uh, and that uh, we know that testosterone compromises the immune system. And so, uh, so only men who have a very healthy immune system can quote afford to crank out a lot of testosterone and produce these masculine facial features, bodily features, and uh, and then symmetry. Uh, of course, the things that cause symmetry are are, are either uh, genetic or environmental insults of various kinds. So if you have a high mutation load, for example, that that we were bilaterally symmetrical species. And so under normal conditions, we develop, you know, the two, two arms, two legs, and they're in relatively equal proportion. And so if there are environmental insults, diseases during development, et cetera, uh, or a high mutation load, these can produce asymmetries. And so, and so again, resistance to these uh, environmental insults or a low mutation load could be markers of genetic quality. So, that, that, that's the, the, so the hypothesis behind the dual mating strategy is perfectly uh, reasonable uh, and, and and logically logically sound. Okay, my problem with it though is that um, uh, both empirical and conceptual. Uh, so uh, so one one is that uh, conceptually, for example, there's the issue of what qualifies as a marker of good genes, and we know, for example, that all traits that have ever been examined have some heritability to them, uh, ranging from, you know, low, most are moderate, and some are above moderate. So for example, intelligence uh, is, uh, uh, IQ is, is uh, moderate to more than moderately heritable. And do women show an ovulation shift toward preferring more intelligent men at ov uh, uh, ovulation compared to non-ovulation? The answer is no, they don't. Well, this finding is buried in a footnote in one of the articles that's promulgating the, good, the dual mating strategy hypothesis, but you can bet if women showed an ovulation shift preference for more intelligent men, uh, then they, they would have that in neon signs, and this is like this 
powerful support for our theory, but it doesn't, so it gets buried in a footnote. Uh, and, and, but the more general point is that if many, many qualities, including good dad qualities, are moderately heritable, why single out masculinity and symmetry as the sole markers of good quality genes? Uh, when there are so many other, um, you know, traits that are heritable and could be markers of good genes and contribute to a woman's fitness or her children's fitness, um, and so and so there's that there's that issue, uh, and, and that's a conceptual issue. Um, a second is uh, an empirical issue, which is that the the evidence for the ovulation shift. Um, effects turns out to be much weaker than initially um, um, claimed. So, uh, you know, so there's something there, something is changing at ovulation, but now there are different theories about why, and uh, a UCLA, UCLA evolutionary psychologist, Jim Roney, I don't know if you've interviewed him yet, but I recommend that you, that you do. He he's kind of has a low-key demeanor but he's super smart and, and has, I think, actually a more compelling theory of uh, the effects of uh, hormones on women's mating psychology. Um, so then, then we get to uh, another empirical issue, uh, which is that women who have affairs tend to be unhappy with their mating relationship. And you may say, well, well that's a huge surprise there. You know, well, people are unhappy, start having affairs. Well, it turns out that's not the case with men. Uh, men who, if you compare men who have affairs with men who don't, there's no difference in their relationship satisfaction or marital happiness, but there is with women. Okay, second, women tend to have affairs with, uh, women tend to fall in love with their affair partners. So about 70%, they get deeply emotionally involved with them. Now, uh, in contrast to men, which is about, men are about 30%. So it's a huge, huge sex difference. Uh, and, uh, it, and, and now if you were gonna design a, a woman who was trying to get good genes from one guy and investment from another guy, the last thing in the world you want is for, for her to fall in love with and become emotionally involved with the guy she's getting good genes from, because that's exactly what you don't want. Um, because that that's going to interfere with the, the long-term mateship and the and the resources derived from them, and so what I what I argue is for what I call the mate switching hypothesis, uh, which is that well, if you ask the question why do women have affairs, you know I think the primary reason is they're unhappy with their mating relationship, they're looking to trade up in the mating market, they're looking to divest themselves of a cost-inflicting partner. They're looking to transition back into the mating pool uh, or they're putting their what I call their big toe in the water to see if there are better mating options out there. Uh, and so uh, and, and so I, I in the in the book, uh, Why Men Be When Men Behave Badly, I outline what I view as empirical evidence in support of the mate switching hypothesis for why women have affairs. Now, of course, the um, there's no logical reason why both hypotheses couldn't be correct. Uh, and, and there are others. So there's the dual mating strategy, there's the mate switching hypothesis strategy, there's the obtaining uh, resources. So under certain conditions, women in principle could uh, obtain more resources from a fair part if she had a f additional affair partners. And those and those could be important. And under certain circumstances, women that might motivate women to have affairs. So the key point that I'm making is that there's no reason why these hypotheses couldn't all have some merit to them. That is, some women under some circumstances engage in affairs for resources, some do it for mate switching, and some do it for good genes. Uh, but I think the bulk of the evidence doesn't support the good genes hypothesis or the dual mating strategy hypothesis. Uh, and if you ask the question, why do most women have affairs? Uh, I think the evidence is very, very um, is is very thin on that. One one other piece of evidence on that, and this is um, not, you know, as you know, with all these hypotheses, you evaluate the weight of the evidence. There's no typically no single empirical finding that definitively 
proves one or refutes another. Uh, and so you have to look at the weight of the evidence across studies. And so there have been analyses of uh, the actual rates of genetic cuckoldry, uh, it, at least in many modern societies. And it turns out, so early on in the field, uh, Baker and Bellis, uh, who wrote a book called Human Sperm Competition, were arguing that uh, the, the genetic cuckoldry rates were like uh, 10 to 14 percent in that range. Uh, but it's tur turned out meta-analyses show that the actual rates are much, much lower. So that is women getting actual genes from men who are not their, you know, social, their uh, uh, social husband or, 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 or long-term mate. So the, the rates are coming in at like 1 to 2 percent uh, of genetic cuckoldry, not 10 to 12 or 10 to 14. Well, now you could argue reasonably that, well, maybe rates of genetic cuckoldry were much higher ancestrally than they are in modern environments because we have birth control and other sorts of things. And that's perfectly plausible and, and possible. Rates of genetic cuckoldry might have been higher uh, in small, you know, traditional hunter-gatherer groups. Um, but, but nonetheless, you know, if it were the case that the rates turned out to be more like the 10 to 14 percent in the modern environments and that the genes that um, uh, women got from these tended to be from men who were highly masculine and very symmetrical again they would be trumpeting that as you know in neon signs as support for that dual mating strategy hypothesis but it doesn't turn out to be the case and so so i think there's um there's, uh, you know, people, as you know, science is a, um, is a human endeavor uh, and people have, you know, personal status and reputations at stake. And, you know, you plant your flag on a particular hypothesis, people tend to cling to it uh, with uh, great alacrity. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and I, I'm not exempt from that, but, but this is just uh, a long-winded way of answering your question about why women have affairs and I, it's something that I've changed my mind about. I used to, I used to be, you know, the, the dual mat, mating strategy hypothesis used to seem very plausible to me, and and I even wrote about it in my book, The Evolution of Desire, and um, uh, and and in other places. And I've just come to question it over time. And as you, as part of your question was also, are there sex differences in what motivates people to have affairs? Yeah. So, so most men who have affairs, and not, not all, cite things like sexual novelty, the opportunity presented itself, sexual gratification. Um, you know, so uh, you know, we know that, um, it, so, so there are massive sex differences in the design, the underlying psychology of why men and women have affairs. Right. Uh, so tell us now about sexual double standards and where they originate from. Particularly, uh, you talk about the what you call the me versus the double standard. So <laughs> yeah. what about it? Yeah. Yeah. OK. So, well, well, uh, OK. So to start with, it, most people, when you say sexual double standards, what they mean is that women are judged more harshly for the same pattern of sexual behavior as men are so so having affairs or having multiple partners or engaging in you know a short-term mating strategy that women that causes more reputational damage to a woman than to a man that's the traditional double standard um, and uh, what what I argue is that there's uh, there's certainly evidence for that uh, and we can go into why uh, but I argued that there's actually another double standard, which is, as you say, the, the me versus the. So there's some evidence of uh, this is from a study of, that asked people what counts as sex. And this is something that surprised, surprised me. I asked my undergraduates this as a thought experiment. I said, does oral sex count as sex? And it, it splits the class. About half say yes and half say no, that's, that's not sex, um, which surprises me because I, I always thought, Oral sex was sex. I mean, it's called oral sex for a reason. But um, but 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 uh, but at any rate, um, what what this study found is if you say you know if if you um, experience oral sex, does that count as sex? Is that sex? 
And what and what studies show is like something like I don't know, third, I'm making up the numbers, but these are precise in the book. Um, of course, estimates. Uh, maybe a third or or 36 percent of say yes, that counts as sex. But if my partner has sex, is more like two thirds. Oh yeah, that's if my partner has oral sex, that is absolutely sex. And so when you ask a man this question, you might think if if you just examine men, you might think aha, that's the standard. Uh, sexual double standard, you know, that, that is, you know, what's, uh, it's okay for men, but not okay for women. Um, but if you ask women the same questions, you get a very similar pattern. They say, well, if, if I have oral sex, it's not really sex, but if my partner does, definitely sex. And so people seem to have different double standards. It's okay for me to, you know, engage in this form of sexual conduct, uh, but not my partner. And, um, and, and sometimes women are baffled by this. So, so this has been, I mean, it's very prominent in, in men. The, one of the examples I use in the book, uh, although there are many others, but is that the Joseph Smith, the uh, founder of uh, the Mormon religion, where uh, he, he was married, happily married to his wife named Emma, but he find, found himself uncontrollably attracted to other women. Now this is of course shocking because most men have never experienced this as you as you know uh, uh, attraction to other women. But what he uh, what it came to him, God came down and and he had this revelation and and he he thought that God couldn't possibly have made other women so attractive and so enticing if he meant meant a man to be limited to just one wife. Uh, and so, uh, and so this further revelations, God told him to create the system of plural marriage. So where, where men can have uh, marry multiple wives. Okay, but if any of the wives have sex with another man, that is blasphemy and she shall be destroyed according to the, the Mormon God's commandment. And so you have this sexual double standard. And so women find it puzzling that men, many men, of course, have this, that, hey, if, if I have sex with someone else, it doesn't really mean anything, um, which can be correct, by the way. It could be just sex. Um, and, uh, you know, but uh, if my partner does, then that is, you know, uh, sexual jealousy emerges and all kinds of havoc follow from that. Uh, so, um, so, so women sometimes find this uh, hypocritical uh, and, and logically inconsistent. And of course, at an abstract level, it is logically inconsistent because what, if there's a standard that should apply equally to, to men and women, uh, and, uh, but an evolutionary perspective reveals, well, it, it is actually perfectly explicable because you're dealing with two very different underlying psychological adaptations in men. One is desire for sexual variety, uh, and the other is sexual jealousy, desire to keep mate totally faithful. Um, so, uh, so, so, but the interesting thing is, and there needs to be more research on this, but there, there seem to be both a male and female sexual double standards, but also the me versus the, as me versus my partner, and uh, men and women uh, are both enforcers of these sexual double standards. So even the classic one, this men versus women, women, uh, our studies uh, and, and other studies find that women, they derogate the hell out of other women who uh, have uh, multiple sex partners, you know, and there are a million words for it, you know, slut, whore, you know, et cetera. There, there are dozens and dozens of derogatory words and, and very few derogatory words for men who do, who do the same thing. But um, uh, now, so from a male perspective, again, if he's evaluating woman for a long-term mateship, if she has had multiple sex partners, then this is a bad cue. Because one of the things men prioritize in long-term mating is sexual fidelity, you know? And, um, you know, what, uh, uh, and if he doesn't um, obtain that, then he is, you know, basically from an evolutionary perspective, wasting his, his commitment. But short-term mating, women who pursue a short-term mating are 
dangerous to other women because if a woman's pursuing a long-term mating strategy, the, the mere presence of short-term mating strategy women in the mating pool, uh, they're willing to have sex with their husbands and boyfriends. And so, uh, and so that's partly why women derogate other women so much on this, uh, as well as trying to reduce their, um, their long-term uh, mating desirability or long-term mate value. Uh, and so the bottom line is both men and women perpetuate these sexual level standards and both men and women engage in the me versus the sexual level standard. Mm -hmm. So last time we talked a little bit about intimate partner violence. Let's talk specifically about stalking. Is that something that we also find occurring during our evolutionary history? Or, it, or is it something novel or something uh, exaggerated by, for example, new technologies like the Internet? Yeah, yeah, no, that's a great question. And, and the short answer is we don't, we don't know for sure how prevalent stalking, that is mate, mating related stalking, was ancestrally. Uh, you're absolutely correct that modern technology enables cyber stalking and um, in ways that are totally evolutionarily unprecedented. Uh, so, um, but I think that, I mean, it's one of these things where, uh, I suspect that, um, uh, precursors of stalking or forms of stalking probably were prevalent, um, ancestrally, perhaps exacerbated in the modern world. Uh, where there's more geographical mobility and, you know, people aren't, you know, staying in one geographical location. And so if you're going to monitor your mate or try to get your mate back, stalking is often designed to do that. So this gets, this might be one of the more controversial hypotheses in my book is that stalking is actually functional um, in that it is, uh, occurs typically uh, by men. So about 80% of the criminal stalkers are men, about 20% women. Uh, and it's designed to either get the woman back who's dumped him uh, and has dumped him in part because either he's either cost inflicting or there's a mate value discrepancy. And it's one thing we found in our studies is that, um, you know, the, the victims of stalking tend to be much higher in mate value than the stalkers. And mm -hmm. so in the stalker's brain, he's lost. So, so I should back up and say that a lot of stalking starts around the time of a breakup and then occurs in the aftermath of a breakup where the, the man is trying to uh, get the woman back or interfere with her attempts to remate with another guy uh, and, and beat off, you know, what he perceives as mate poachers. And sometimes it works, you know, so in our studies, um, you know, of uh, victims of stalking, you know, women say things like, I, you know, I, I tried to go out with another guy and every time I would, my ex would come around and threaten the guy and chase him off. And most guys would be a little reluctant, you know, to get involved with someone who has a potentially dangerous stalker. Uh, and so they might say, you know, um, you know, look, I really like you and everything, but call me when you get rid of your stalker. <laughs> so, um, now, of course, uh, sometimes I think it's a last ditch effort, you know, that is, it's not like a, the first strategy that men pull out, uh, but, um, but rather the man perceives that he will not be able to replace this woman that he's lost with someone of equivalent mate value or not be able to replace her at all, you know, and, and that may be, a, uh, those may, may be realistic uh, appraisals given that these guys are substantially lower in mate value. Now, a lot of times, probably in most cases, stalking does not work. That is, the woman doesn't go back to the guy, doesn't have sex with him, but sometimes it does work. So sometimes she sees him again, sometimes has sex with him. And, uh, and then of course it, it, it tends to be very effective in scaring off other men. Uh, and so, um, and so most, I mean, there's a tendency, Ricardo, and you probably know this, in the field of psychology to pathologize b 
behavior. And so right. even things like intimate partner violence or stalking, or we can maybe even PTSD, we can get into that. So is is uh, oh that's a pathology. They're even like sexual jealousy. People oh that's a that's a pathology. Um, and um, but um, but. If you have an evolutionary lens, you at least have to entertain the hypothesis that these are not pathologies, but rather um, uh, functional patterns, functional strategies that e that emerge from uh, an evolved sexual psychology. That's very interesting. So if these are not really pathologies and perhaps they might occur in certain circumstances, some of them potentiated by the sort of modern environments we live in, how do you think we should deal with them? Do you think that perhaps there would be some environmental strategies to put to use there or not? Uh, to, to curb stalking? Uh-huh, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think that, you know, this, this gets back to, and I know you know this, but not all of your listeners will, is that um, invoking an evolutionary explanation or a functional explanation does not mean that the behavior is inevitable or ineluctable or it doesn't mean we can't change it. I mean, one of the things we know about human evolved psychology is that we are very sensitive to things like social norms, sensitive to punishments, etc. And so, uh, for example, like I think that there are adaptations to murder people, homicidal adaptations that I've written about in my one of my other books, The Murderer Next Door. Uh, but but in fact, we've created circumstances that have dramatically reduced homicide rates. But I think without those, without an effective police force, judges, juries, jails, um, and very strong social norms against killing, I think murder rates would be a lot higher. And I think there's evidence that they were a lot higher um, in in deep over deep time in human evolutionary history. So, uh, so with respect to stalking, I, I think that um, you know uh, laws uh, and uh, and changing social norms are are uh, ways to deal with it. And I mean, one of the remarkable things is that stalking laws are relatively recent. Uh, so stalking was not viewed as a crime. I I think they came in in the early '90s if my memory it serves me correctly. And so that means prior to that, I mean, women victims, and I knew some who were stalked prior to those. I mean, it would be, I know this one woman, I'll just mention, I won't mention her name, but she was, uh, went out with a guy for about three months. He fell head over heels in love with her and she decided she wanted to end the relationship. So she ended the relationship and he stalked her and his leave her letters and, stuff on our doorstep got increasingly threatening and, inc and his letters got increasingly violent to the point where she literally had to change her name, legally change her name and move to a different city uh, in order to escape this um, stalker because there weren't, there weren't laws against what he was doing at that, at that point. So, um, so, so I, I think that now, now of course there are, I mean, men can be notoriously persistent <coughs> and um, violate the laws and find ways around them and so forth. Uh, but, but nonetheless, I think these, these things, just like intimate partner violence, can be um, reduced substantially and, and in the case of intimate partner violence has been reduced substantially. So now that, now that the, the laws, laws are stricter about it, uh, police are more uh, aware. So, for example, with intimate partner violence, uh, if there's a report of intimate partner violence, the po is police in many jurisdictions are required to arrest the suspected perpetrator, even if the victim does not want to press charges. Uh, and so there, there's been a shift in, in that and a commensurate decrease in the rates of intimate partner violence, although it's still pretty pervasive. Mm -hmm. Another topic that you touched on in the book is harassment, specifically when it comes to workplace harassment. Do you think that that constitutes a form of evolutionary mismatch in the sense that perhaps 
the workplace as we have it in modern societies differs considerably from the ways men and women interacted uh, among themselves in more traditional hunter gatherer societies, for example? Yes, yeah, I, I, I do. And um, you must have read that section of my book very carefully <laughs> to ask that question. So, so yeah, I mean, w uh, you know, hit, hit, over human evolutionary history, men's work and women's work was often sharply divided. So uh, that as men engaged in things like large game hunting with coalitions of other men, they engaged in things like warfare with other men. They engaged in defense of the group against of a, an attacking group with coalitions of other men. Uh, women, uh, very few did large game hunting from what we can tell. Uh, sometimes small game hunting squirrels, uh, but, but mostly gathering uh, food preparation and so forth. And, and they did this with other women. Uh, and, so, and so historically, men's work and women's work were sex segregated to some non-trivial degree. In the modern world, there's a bit of a mismatch in that sense. Now you, you put men and women into the same workplace environment uh, and uh, interacting daily and mating mechanisms go off, you know, uh, get, get activated, not surprisingly. And in particular, when you get a, uh, as, as occurs in many professions, uh, somewhat older, high status men in positions of power and younger women uh, coming in. And we know that men are attracted to younger women and that this does not um, stop uh, as men get older. I have this, uh, I wish I had this exact quote. I just got an email yesterday uh, by a, an 85 year old man. And so that I'm paraphrasing what he what he said is he had just read my book um, when when men behave badly, and right. he he said that uh, at 85 years old, um, uh, my brain, without my permission, still assesses women on their sexual attractiveness every time I pass one by, and so. Um, and so there's this, so he, this is a guy, and he doesn't want his brain to do this. Uh, he's 85 years old, so he's not going to be acting on this, presumably. Uh, maybe he's happily married. I don't know what his circumstances are, but men find themselves attracted to, you know, to younger, younger women. So you, so you put, uh, and then on the flip side, women are attracted to men who are high in status and power. And so you have this uh, interesting volatile mix where, um, where mating adaptations get activated, mating or mating psychology gets activated. Now, when it comes to sexual harassment, though, it it is not all men who do it. And, and so most men in positions of power do not sexually harass women, uh, even if they, in principle, could. Uh, most men find it uh, morally abhorrent or objectionable, etc. But we know now, uh, as I describe in my book, the, the characteristics of the men who are serial sexual harassers. And so you have a small percentage of men doing most of the sexual harassing in the workplace. And these are the men, I think we talked about this a little in our previous conversation, men who are high in the dark triad mm -hmm. traits. So narcissism, Machiavellianism, psychopathy, combined with a short-term mating strategy. Uh, now, the other thing that contributes to sexual harassment uh, is uh, is the male sexual overperception bias, and I think we also chatted about that briefly earlier. Um, that is, uh, men, um, especially if they're high in status and especially if they're high on narcissism, uh, think that the woman is actually sending them sexual signals, and so and so they're approaching women in a sexual manner. And they think it's reciprocated uh, when, it, when, in fact, many times uh, it is not. And this is one of the interesting, I know you interviewed a former student of mine, Karen Perilou, and talked about right. the sexual uh, overperception bias. But one of the things that's, uh, that we found in that study that has been kind of um, neglected in terms of uh, discussion is that it's not all men who do this. It's men who are high in narcissism are, and, and high in short-term mating strategy are much more likely to over perceive sexual interest. And I think it's actually a design feature 
uh, of short-term mating strategy. That is, if you're going to pursue a short-term mating strategy, it's going to pay off if you think, if you believe that other women actually are sexually interested in you, if you think they're not, then you're going to get a lot of rejections. But that belief that they are sexually interested in you gives you the green light to pursue, to pursue that. And, and we know that, um, I, I cite a couple examples in the book where uh, it's clear that these high status narcissistic men are making, are doing, the, uh, are engaging in a sexual overperception bias. And because uh, like in the case of a uh, former Senator Bob Packwood, uh, he, he literally wrote in his journal that he knew these women were attracted to him. Otherwise, why would they, you know, be at the co in the copy room just when he was and admiring his bulging biceps and all that? Anyway, he was accused by 20 different women of sexual harassment and then eventually uh, was forced out of the Senate uh, before he got convicted of it and before they forced him out. Uh, so, um, uh, so but get, it gets back to the key point, and, and this is why I have some reservation, I had some reservation about the title of my book, When Men Behave Badly, just in the sense that it's not a book about male bashing, and it's not all men. Uh, it's, it's a minority of men who commit the majority of, in this case, acts of sexual harassment. Mm -hmm. But since you mentioned men in positions of power in the context of the workplace when it comes to sexual harassment, do you think that when feminists say that sexual harassment is not about sex, but it's rather about power, could they have a point there? Could they be at least partly right? Yeah, yeah, of course they could be partly right. I mean, this is one of the mistakes that people make is they think that human behavior has to be caused by one motive. You know, and so it is possible that some men sexually harass because uh, they get off on the um, on the power aspect of it. But um, but to think that uh, it well, and the other critical thing is uh, so, so so I think that most sexual harassment is not motivated by power. By power, by the way, I think it's motivated by attempts to gain sexual access. Um, okay. Um, however, what was I going to say? Um, I lost my train of thought there. I apologize for that. Um, that, uh, oh, the question was, uh, power. Oh, well, one, one issue is that, uh, and there's some evidence for this, that men in positions of power, when they get power, when they get high status, they feel sexually entitled. Uh, and, oh, I remember the point that I was going to make is the perspective of the victim versus the perspective of the perpetrator of sexual harassment. And so from the perspective of the perpetrator, I think in most instances, it's an attempt to gain sexual access. Um, but from the perspective of the victim, it's not, it's not sex. And so uh, it, 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 it's, it's a form of, um, it's harassment. Or, or even a form of violence or a form of abuse of power. And so from the perspective of the victim, it's very different, uh, it, reasonably so. Um, uh, the other thing is that many women do not view, and I asked some women about this, uh, you know, why do they think it's all about power, not at all about sex? And their perspective was that uh, for many women, sex is sex within the context of a relationship in an emotional right. in involvement. And so that's not sex for them. Some guy in positions of power, you know, leering at them, making sexual overtures, that's not sex from their perspective. Um, and so I think, again, this kind of, the, this um, feminist perspective is more reasonable when you understand that there are differences between the psychology of the perpetrators and the victims uh, and that, uh, and that what sheds light on it is understanding that male and female sexual psychologies are fundamentally different. Um, and so pr pretending, you know, what I call sex difference denialism, I think is the, is the, uh, is the scourge, the modern scourge of, uh, which totally surprises me because, uh, the sex differences in the domain of mating and sexuality and aggression, which of course is related to mating and sexuality are, 
the largest and most well-documented and most replicable findings in the field of psychology. So, um, you know, but understanding the underlying sexual psychology of men and women and how they differ is critical to shedding light, even on these things like feminist versus evolutionary perspectives on sexual harassment. Mm -hmm. So uh, last time and also today when talking about stalking, I asked you about perhaps some strategies that we could use to deal with these different forms of sexual coercion. But from an evolutionary perspective, what are some of the strategies women themselves have against sexual coercion? Yeah, okay, great question. So you've obviously read chapter eight of my book where it's a, it's a long and, and I think the most important chapter of my book in some ways in that it is the only attempt that I know to um, assemble all of the possible defenses that women have against sexual coercion. And I think there are about a dozen of them that I have there. Uh, and, uh, and so I'll just perhaps mention a few. I can't, I can't go into all of them and I hope sure. I hope people will, will read that chapter, uh, especially, and I, I have a table that lays them out. So, so one is uh, fear. Uh, we know that fear is an evolved emotion. Um, you know, the, the fight or flight response, uh, et cetera, it's one of, one of the most ancient and um, conserved emotions that humans have, and it has a very long and deep history, a mammalian history. Um, but women, fear strange males, uh, and they feel fear strange males also who, who uh, start talking about sex a lot. Uh, and, so, and so this fear causes women to avoid circumstances that would put themselves in sexual danger. So like uh, going out at night alone, for example, or going to I don't know, a, a fraternity party unaccompanied, you know, where there might be spiked, um, you know, drinks uh, there. So, so, so fear is one of the first lines of, uh, of defense. Another is, uh, which I think is evolutionarily ancient, is bodyguards. So bodyguards, that is uh, the husbands, the fathers, the brothers, the sisters, the female friends, the male friends, uh, who can basically deter sexual coercion before it even happens. So someone who's gonna to try to sexually coerce a woman or sexually assault a woman is gonna be deterred if there's a, a, you know, three big formidable brothers, um, you know, in close proximity of the woman. Uh, and, and so, and women also actively enlist bodyguards uh, uh, and, and one of the sort of tragedies, and this is again, a mismatch between ancestral and modern environments is that you have, uh, women who, who grow up in a family and then they go off to college or university a thousand miles away, uh, where they don't have their close kin and proximity and they don't have their friendship network established yet, uh, which is why freshman women, first year university women are most at risk of, of sexual coercion because they are all of a sudden uh, devoid of the bodyguards that they that they formerly had. Um, I'll mention another one. One one is uh, uh, freezing, where you know when you when there's a when there's a threat, uh, and this is also evolutionarily ancient, and we do it when there are predators in the environment. This is why I think the predator prey analogy is very much on point in some respects with respect to sexual assault and victims of sexual assault or sexual predators and victims of sexual predators um, is that um, when there is a threat one of the things people do is they they freeze which causes you to mobilize your attention to the source of the threat its location its actual danger possible escape routes etc and so freezing is is a uh, is another uh, I think evolved defense. Um, and then maybe I'll mention, uh, two, two more. Um, uh, one is, um, uh, tonic immobility. Okay. And tonic immobility is, is, is sometimes called rape paralysis because it's uh, so common, uh, curse in somewhere between 30 and 40, 45% of, um, of rapes where the woman feels a high level of fear 
and she feels entrapped. That is, the, that is, there's, she's either in an enclosed space with no escape routes or has been physically overpowered or the guy has a weapon. So high level of fear combined with entrapment, the woman experiences this bodily par paralysis uh, where they often get numb. And one of the, uh, and interestingly, there are animals who do this, prey animals do that as well. They're this tonic immobility. And, uh, and, and one hypothesis is that it's an adaptation that will minimize the, the actual harm done to the woman that that is rapists often use as much violence as they need to accomplish the rape now some go overboard some are sadists and go overboard on that uh, but if with uh, tonic immobility uh, it, it's in essence a signal uh, to the uh, sexual assaulter that he does not need to use violence now one of the tragedies of tonic immobility, it's, and it's, as I mentioned, surprisingly common. Uh, the tragedy is that people often blame the woman for the sexual assault because they say, why didn't you fight him off? Or why didn't you, you don't have any bruises or scars or scrapes or bloody, you know, whatever. Uh, uh, you know, why didn't you fight him off? And women themselves feel guilty. They, they, they think in retrospect, I should have done more. Um, and I think understanding that this is an involuntary response uh, to this high level of fear and feeling of entrapment. Uh, and it's not that the woman consciously decides, oh, uh, I'm not going to fight him off. It's an involuntary response. Understanding that it's an evolved involuntary response, I think, will help people not to blame the woman uh, for not doing more and also will hopefully um, eliminate self-blame or reduce self-blame because women often feel guilty. They feel somehow that they could have done more, should have done more when they can't because it's an involuntary response. And so, um, and so tonic immobility is, is I think an important one. And then the final one that I'll mention, I realize I'm going on at great length here, probably a lot no, more, no than, more than you want, but the last thing I'll mention is uh, PTSD, post-traumatic stress uh, disorder, as it's called. And I raised the hypothesis, and it's not, uh, it's not original with me, actually. A guy named Cantor originally proposed this, that these symptoms of post-traumatic st stress um, uh, might actually reflect adaptations. So, um, so one of the things that we know that is associated with post-traumatic stress is things like... Uh, agoraphobia. So women like don't want to leave the house, uh, flashbacks and, uh, you know, and so, uh, it might be the hypothesis. It might be the brain's way of telling a woman, don't put yourself, you know, don't go over that hill, you know, where the sexual assault happened before. Um, and so, uh, so now this this might be quite controversial to propose that it's that it's not a disorder, but it actually might be functional. And um, uh, you know, and, and I guess the final one I I know I said I was going to tell you the final one, but the but one final one is concealment. So that is one of the most common things that women do when they experience a sexual assault. They often conceal it. They, they, something like half of the women don't tell anybody. They don't even tell their best friends. Um, and now why do they conceal it? Now, and people, uh, they conceal for a variety of reasons. You know, one is that people suspect, well, was it truly a rape or did you, were you a, a willing participant? Um, and so there's the not being believed. There's the, the low probability of a sexual assault or actually getting convicted of, of the crime, and, and it is, very few do get convicted of the crime. There's the prospect of going through a grueling, you know, trial and interrogation by police and further humiliation where women often experience it as a, as a second rape. That is, that is that it's, you know, uh, going through the aftermath of revealing it is often more traumatic or as traumatic as the actual rape itself. And so, uh, and we know from an evolutionary perspective, 
it causes a decrease in the woman's perceived mate value. Uh, and uh, it leads to, if she has a husband or boyfriend, it, there's a huge breakup rate uh, in the aftermath. Uh, and so concealing it um, could in fact be functional for, for women because of the cost they incur by revealing it. Uh, and so, uh, and so anyway, you start with fear and then you go up through, I also talk about appeasement versus fighting, uh, and which, which of these are more effective. And I think people need to know, uh, men and women need to know which defenses are the most effective, especially in the modern environment. So anyway, that's a very long winded answer to your, to your question. No, but it, it was great. It was very informative. So, uh, so as my final question, and this will be, I think, a two-part question. So back in 2018, in our very first interview, one of the questions I asked you was if you thought let, like, uh, that things like virtual pornography would tweak men's brains specifically into thinking that perhaps there were more uh, sexually available women than they really were and perhaps tweak them into preferring short-term mating strategies. So since then, and since it has been already three years and you wrote this book, I was wondering if you would have any new insights on that. And then my follow-up question would be, do you think that those sorts of technologies like virtual pornography would be good enough perhaps to prevent some some forms of sexual violence from occurring so for example uh, as acting as a sort of outlet for the most violent men that perhaps uh, by resorting to that they wouldn't be as prone as uh, as prone to committing sexually violent acts against women yeah, yeah, or, or the incels, you know, there's women who are unable to attract women to normal means of courtship. Uh, sure. Uh, we will provide an outlet for those. So, um, <clears throat> well, I can't remember exactly what I, uh, what, what I said in our previous interview with respect to these, but I do think that the prevalence of pornography uh, has the effect of uh, triggering in men's minds the perception that there are lots of sexually available and willing women. Uh, and, so, uh, and so that may curtail their inclination to pursue a long-term committed relationship. Uh, and in fact, we know actually statistically in many, in many cultures, uh, there's been a decline, a decline in marriage rates, a decline in long-term commitment, and uh, also in, in some cases, uh, a, a rise in the hookup culture you know, with uh, Tinder online uh, dating and so forth. And so, uh, so I think that, uh, you know, it has, my guess is it has that effect and um, perhaps creates unrealistic expectations of what an actual sexual in-person uh, relationship is like. So, so in porn male pornography, anyway, it's like the woman walks into the room and then within 30 seconds, there's, sex happening. Uh, there's no context, there's no emotional involvement, there's no prelude. And, and the woman, of course, is always uh, extremely willing and uh, to, do, to do whatever the guy wants. So, um, so I think that, that creates unrealistic expectations where the guy goes to real life and expects the woman to either be like that or to be a sexual acrobat that they see on the pornography. Uh, so, so, uh, but a lot of these are your questions are empirical questions that, you know, that we don't have great data to answer yet, uh, but, but should over time, uh, with respect to things like, uh, sex dolls, uh, which have become increasingly realistic, uh, virtual reality sex, which is becoming increasingly realistic. I mean, it's, it's, it's fascinating in a way that, uh, that these technologies, are, are developing. Not surprising from an evolutionary perspective that males seem to be the most heavy consumers of these technologies. Um, I don't see throngs of women clamoring for them. Um, but I think that, I think that 
uh, I mean, there's controversy around things like virtual sex and, and the sex dolls, but I actually suspect that it will have a beneficial effect uh, uh, precisely for the reasons that you, you, that you allude to, perhaps resulting in a decrease in rape rates um, uh, and also uh, finding uh, uh, outlets for, for incels, that is involuntarily celibate men who cannot attract a woman for one reason or another due to low mate value or due to a little bit of um, on the Asperger's spectrum, you know, disorder. So they, they lack the social skills to, to attract women uh, uh, that these, um, these technologies, these sexual technologies uh, could, uh, you know, uh, help alleviate a lot of problems for, for men. Um, yeah. So those are, I don't have any brilliant insights into that, but, uh, but, but I guess other things being, I mean, uh, as I said, it's an empirical question. What, what will the actual effects be when these technologies become more widespread? <clears throat> but, um, you know, those would be my predictions. Okay, great. So let's end on that note. The book is again, when men behave badly, the hidden roots of sexual deception, harassment and assault. Uh, Dr. Bus, would you like to tell people where I can find your work on the internet? Yeah, so um, the easiest way is to just uh, Google my name, David Bus, um, and go to my website. So I have a, a website, davidbus.com, uh, not hard to remember. And on the website, there are links to my new book, When Men Behave Badly, uh, and also links to all, all my other books. I have a, I don't know how many I have now, um, seven or eight or nine. And then also it contains links to the scientific articles, which people can download for free, uh, and um, links to my current graduate students, former graduate students, and other potential resources uh, in this domain. So davidbus.com is the place to go. By the way, do you have any new book coming down the pipeline or is that too early to ask? Yeah, yeah I, I do, but it is too early to ask because I haven't started writing it yet. <laughs> I've started out, outlining it, but, um, but I think that, you know, after this uh, deep dive into the dark side of human sexuality and sexual conflict, uh, I'm going to move to something a bit lighter. So, uh, you know, uh, so I have some ideas uh, on that. One, one is uh, the focus on status hierarchies. So the psychology of status. And uh, I think there's a lot of interesting things there and there hasn't been enough work done on that. So, so that's probably my next big project. But I'm so consumed with and excited about my new, this new book, When Men Behave Badly, that I haven't had the psychological space to devote to, to any new books yet. Okay, so anyway, I'm very much looking forward to it. And as always, it's been a real pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ricardo. It's great talking to you. And I appreciate how much homework you do and, and uh, intelligence you put into these discussions. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, guys. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing, please do not forget to support the channel. You can go over to Patreon at patreon.com slash the dissenter. And you also have links to PayPal in the description box of the interview. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share the interview, leave a like, leave a comment and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and supporters, Karen Litzke and Blanchett, Perga Larson, Logorero, Francis Fordens, Frederick Sunder, Ricardo Vladimir, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whitting, Bordarno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Henry Kalenia, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Voss, Bo Weingard, Rebecca Newberger Goldstein, Dan Demetrio, Robert Windegger, Rui Inácio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Thomas Trumbull, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Columba, George Spinha, Phil Cavanagh, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Mikkel Stormir, Eric Neumann, 
Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Yugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Omri Hickson, Fergal Cusson, Yevan Podrenko, Hal Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Leibrand, Oslem, Oslem Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W. João Weira, Tom Hummel, David Sloan Wilson, Yassil Adez Araújo, Ethan Solon, Romain Roach, Dmitry Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punter, Adana Ruzmani, Charlotte Please, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostazewski, Nelek Pak, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, G Gary G. Elman, João Linhares, Lida Cosmides, Saima Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paulo Tolentino, João Barbosa, My Producers, Isar Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Taffini, Akian Gilligan, Sérgio Quadriano, Luís Caetano, Tom Van Agdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Guidi, Sardis Friends, and Nirvan Balachandran, and my executive producers, Michel Rugieski, Rosie, James Pratt, and Matthew Lavender. Thank you for all.